Welcome to Make It, Share It, the podcast where we explore the simple but profound process to overcome fear, doubt, perfectionism, and more enemies of creativity. Make it and share it. We'll talk to creators of all kinds, from artists and writers to entrepreneurs and inventors, to learn about their creative process, the challenges they faced, and how they overcame them by making and sharing. Whether you're an artist, entrepreneur, or someone who wants to create but feels stuck, this podcast is for you. Creativity, meet courage. All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Make It, Share It. Um, I'm Kent Rabelle. I realize that I neglect to say that sometimes, so that's who I am. Uh, and then I'm joined, as always, by Lauren Chandler and Stephen Cooper. Hey, guys. Hey guys. And hello, hello. And today, our guest is Rachel Joy. Hello, hello. Hey. hey. So glad that you're here. Rachel is the founder of Sparrow Collective and Sparrow really exists to help catalyze women, to help them see their unique significance in the world and then go out and make a difference and make an impact. And then there's more coming too with uh, some other, just really there's always more coming with Sparrow because Rachel yeah. has so many great ideas, but I guess I'll hold that in case it just you decide it comes up, some of the other new things are coming. But yeah, uh, yeah, we'll talk through how Sparrow Collective does that um, through um all kinds of amazing ways of events with impact and shopping with impact and just, again, just catalyzing uh, women and uh, helping them make a difference in the world with their unique gifts. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, super excited to have you on the show, Rachel, and to talk so to more of here. that. Thanks for doing this. Mm -hmm. yeah, so sure. we're going to start off with something fun. Uh, our friend Nathan, I think it was a good challenge that I, I tend to just want to drop uh, into the deep end pretty quick. <laughs> And uh, on our last episode, uh, he he wanted to, to have some fun first, which I'm like, you know what? That's fine. That's we can talk about home alone houses and, and things like that. Yeah. So <laughs> I thought, you know what? Let's let's incorporate that. So I just want to ask you a fun question to get okay. started. So what would you say is your favorite cheat meal? Like if you could mm -hmm. just you're like, have whatever you want. Doesn't matter about calories, anything. You just are like enjoying a great meal. What would you pick? Man, that's really hard. Um, favorite cheat meal. I'm I'm not a big like casserole person. Not a big none of that. Um, but I do, y'all. I think y'all know this about me though. I love potatoes. I do. I love them. I love them all kinds of ways. Okay, so I'd probably go with steak and a baked potato. I I just. It's just a good, hearty meal. Um, and then I followed up with like a huge piece of chocolate cake, mm -hmm. uh, chocolate, steak, and potatoes. Yes, please. All that. Love it. Okay. I have to admit think? something right now. <clears throat> yeah. One, when you said this, I was like, my life is a cheat meal, Kent. <laughs> okay. So just let me just start there. Um, Probably be true. What <laughs> Rachel just described as her cheat meal would be me being good. Yes. <laughs> okay, that's two. That's number two concern. And three, the biggest concerning thing, you know that movie, what was the uh, Brendan Fraser movie, The Whale? Oh. And he okay, talked so about the true. weight he did gain for that besides wearing all the prosthetics. And he talked about like how crazy his diet was with just fast food and these different things and drinking Mountain Dew, just trying to get empty, empty calories um, without doing major damage. And the the horrible diet he described, I was sitting there going like, that's, that's what I ate yesterday. Wait a minute. Hold on. That was last week for me. I was like, I need to make some changes. This is horrible. Um, and everyone, when he was describing his meals, they were all going, oh gosh, Arby's. What? Oh no. And I was like, as I'm putting down my big beef and cheddar, oh, man, man, I need to make some changes. Okay. <laughs> this is this is a wake up call for me, guys. Thank you. Right. But just trying to help people one at a time on this show. I was thinking Man. that funny. I was like, hey, <laughs> vegan potato. That's like a healthy meal. Normally, yeah. you know, I think with uh, we've got kids and our youngest playing volleyball, it's like Brahms at night mm -hmm. at like nine o'clock. I mean, that's what we're eating. So I'm probably on the yeah. same hit, Steven. Yeah. yeah. I, I think if you've known me for any amount of time, you know that I don't really think about food a whole lot. It's more like the ambiance. Like it's where I am. It's the people I'm with. I I kind of cling to those things more than what I'm eating, which is kind of weird. I know, but I'm just like, 
eh, food, but if there's good drink, good friend, I'm in. Yeah. Yeah. You okay. Know? So who are the, who are the three friends? If you could just pick three. I'm just kidding. I would never do that to you. <laughs> you cannot do that to me. That is my first nightmare. Other than, other than me, Coop and Lauren. No, I'm just kidding. No, I won't do that to you. Um, That's my worst nightmare. Yeah, I know. Like, no, you know, instead, who's your least favorite friend of your husband? Let's just start there. No. Can't do that either. Can't do that either. So okay. Oh, go. my goodness. All right. Now we're going to go deep. Okay, here we go. Uh, <laughs> enough, go. enough fun and games. No. Um, so we like to start off uh, this show with talking about uh, some type of significant event that happened when you were younger. And younger could be five. It could be 17. I mean, mm-hmm. it, you know, it's more just what are what is that kind of space that you look back on and think, man, that really did change how I think, live and relate in the world. Mm-hmm. You, again, we may do this more, um, Sparrow does this through S coaching. And so, mm-hmm. you know, I know you're very familiar with this and I've done a lot of story work. Um, and, and so we're just thinking about, it, it could be related to how you ended up creating um, in life. It could be a, a personal domain. It could be family. It's really just wherever you feel comfortable sharing and, and what comes to mind when you think about that. So what, uh, what would that be? Or at least what's one that you could yeah. share with us? You know, I was thinking about this. I think about the past a lot, just with the story work that we do through coaching. And um, for me, the place that when I am going through difficult spots, when I've had difficult seasons, the place that I go back to in my head or the place that I dream about most is my mamaw's house in Rockwell, Texas. Um, Her name was Vela Lahoma. It was a mouthful. Vela Lahoma. Uh, I thought her name for the longest time was Vanilla. Because I, I did not understand that that was true to her name. Anyway, uh, when I think about her house, um, you know, I grew up in a really kind of tumultuous environment. It, it was a, my home, my, my home with my mom, my dad, my brother was a really um, difficult space. I felt like I walked on eggshells a lot. So when I went to Mamaw's house, it was a safe place for me to be me. Um, she created an environment that I could create, that I felt safe enough to create. Um, and so a memory of mine from, you know, uh, way back is walking through her garden. She had a rose garden. She had, um, a vegetable garden and and in those spaces, I learned a lot about growth. I learned a lot about planting seasons. I learned a lot about, um, weeds. I learned a lot about life um, through the, my experiences with her. One really sweet experience with her was um, I used to go in her living room and uh, I would stand on her first and um, create like a chalkboard out of her Brookshire Brothers bags and um, her sewing chalk. And I would gather anyone who was in her home, my aunts, my cousins, Uh, She had kind of an open door policy. Uh, Everyone came in through the back door. Nobody came in through the front um, because everyone was seen as friends and family, uh, family, you know, and I want to create that environment in our home, which is why we have a back door. I tell my friends, go through the back door. Don't go through the front door. You know, Uh, we want to create that warmth. And so um, I would gather whoever was there um, and I would pretend to teach them things. I would pretend to, I would start asking questions. What was created early on in me um, was the ability to ask a good question because I was being asked good questions. And so I wanted to recreate that because I think you can disarm people with good questions um, and disarm them in a way that makes them feel safe, seen, loved, valued, known. And so I learned that from her and then emulated that to, to, other, to other people because I felt safe. Um, and I think anytime you're creating something, um, or God's working that creation, you know, creativity in you, you have to feel safe. And, um, and Mamaw's place was, that was safety for me. So when things get difficult here, I remember there were a few summers ago, uh, and we were going through some things, um, personally and in ministry and immediately, do you know where I drove? <laughs> to Mamaw's house in Rockwell. She didn't live there anymore. Um, she has since passed on. 
But I needed that sense of stability and home. And, you know, her stability was in the Lord. Um, I have all of her old devotionals, but um, there is something about that place and that home that I just felt safe. And so um, I'll, I'll probably go back there again, over and over again, just because of sense of home that I experienced there. Wow. That's great. Yeah, yeah. there's, um, I think the safety piece is so big in creativity. Um, mm -hmm. I love that you're highlighting that. Um, and, and just sharing that not everybody gets that, you know, like you're saying that wasn't necessarily your home that you were spending most of your time in, you know, and I'm sure right. listeners, other listeners can relate where they didn't have that. Some, some people do and praise the Lord for that. And then right. a lot of us don't, um, for mm -hmm. a lot of reasons. And so to find that space, mm -hmm. um, and for that to be able to open up, I love that then mm -hmm. that's what you do for others all these years later, mm -hmm. um, through mm -hmm. your work. And so that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. so thank you. Yeah. For yeah. sharing that. Uh, I had like you, one uh, hour a day, uh, at, at this key part of my life at the end of junior high into high school where my older sister was gone to college and it was that staggered bus schedule. So junior high started like an hour and a half later than high school and all that stuff. And my mom taught high school and then my dad would, was gone at work till late. And so I had like this awesome hour every day after school where I could play guitar or bass mm -hmm. as loud as I wanted and learn Pantera songs and no one could hear me how horrible I was and no one could tell me to turn down. Now I found out years later that my poor neighbor <laughs> had been tortured by this because my <laughs> room was on the driveway that shared next to his house. And so I felt so bad when I heard about this, that this old man listened to me figuring out heavy metal at 13 years old, but I had an hour where like, no one could hear me. No one could tell me to be quiet, but I could really go for it. Yeah. And I feel like that's where I got good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cause you can't play timid or practice timid or try to create timidly. No. And I've learned that in hindsight. Like, so I've tell parents that, you know, now that I have kids and parents like, Hey, my daughter just got her first drum set, man, we're in for it. I'm like, you are because you got to let her play yeah. and like encourage her to play whether it's headphones or not. Like she needs a room where she can shut the door and it's still going to be super loud and horrible. <laughs> Like my nephew is playing the tuba right now uh, oh. with school, like in junior high. And I was just telling my sister, I was like, just get ready for just. And they're like, what is he even doing in there? Or just these horrible noises. It's like, just let him rock it, you know? Yeah. That's so true. Uh, our middle, he plays guitar and the space I'm in right now used to be like carpeted, like halfway up the walls. Because the people that owned this before, uh, he was a drummer. And so this oh, is nice. where he jam with his band. And it was like maroon, like bad maroon carpet. But we tore it out. It does not look like that anymore. But Reed would come up here and he would play his electric or he would be singing, you know. Um, and I agree. There are those safe places to create and to, yeah. to create something. <laughs> And then, yeah. Yeah, it, you know, and grow and, um, gosh, that's like right now it's the car for me or the shower yeah. and sometimes it's home and my kids just have to deal with it. Or even goes, well, they're like, mom, she'll sing this one phrase over and over. And I don't understand. I'm like, yes, I'm trying to get better <laughs> shaping some vowels or how I need to support myself. I'm like, so just deal with it. Okay. So, yeah. That's great. Well, let's, uh, what we'll do now is we normally move into just something that you've made, you know, and, and again, with Sparrow, you could talk about that at a high level. You know, I know it has its own decade long journey now that you could describe. Yeah. <clears throat> also, obviously though, there are all these things that have, you know, come out of that overall story of helping mm -hmm. women with their unique significance and catalyzing them into their communities that we could talk about, you know, so. I, I leave it to you, you know, wherever you want to go with this, but just to kind of understand some of the challenges, some of the, the, the blocks, some of the resistance that you've faced in trying to make whatever you want to share with us today. 
Yeah. I was thinking about this this morning, y'all. I am a big dreamer, um, big visionary. I'm not great at um, the small details. I really am not. And I thank God for the team that God has given me because <clears throat> they make it happen. So, um, and you know, Kristen, Kent's wife is uh, like such a beautiful piece of the pie um, at Sparrow. Um, she executes with excellence and I'm just really grateful for her. I was thinking about how um, sometimes not every good, I- every idea needs to come to fruition, but it's about the process of working through the idea. Um, when you have a team to consider, they're really great about going, no, we can't do that, you know, um, because I have a lot of really fun, um, fun ideas because I do want to create impact because I do want women to live on purpose. So the whole idea behind Sparrow, um, the collective from the collective to Sparrow on Main, our event center to Sparrow and Co, our store to coaching is we want to help women be intentional Um and live out their God-given purpose. So we can kind of go through the motions of life and go, yeah, I'm kind of good at that, or I kind of enjoy this. But really being intentional and knowing that that's how God created and wired you and knowing those specific things so that you can be clear and confident in how you're moving forward in in and throughout life. Um, And to be unapologetic about it. I think there were years that I thought, man, I'm too much. I am too much for people. Um, and I have these big ideas and dreams and I, I really think God can do it. Um, and he has done it, but I had to kind of step into it, like leave fear behind and step out into um, what God was asking me to do and link arms with people who are going to help me do it. Um, so, I mean, what we've created is a place um, of peace, home, or a a, a light on the corner of Main and Mill um, that p- welcomes people in, <clears throat> no matter your walk of life. So you might be a woman who is at risk, um, below the poverty line, and we want her in the space just as much as we want the stay-at-home mom, just as much as we want the woman who is an empty nester, and we want to catalyze them into their identity, gifting, and purpose because we believe that all people were created to make kingdom impact. Um, and so, and it's not just that, um, we're all supposed to do it the same way. Like not everyone's like a quote unquote Bible teacher or whatever. Um, but that we were created with a specific, uh, unique God given identity that we, um, can step into spaces and offer, um, yeah, offer our unique expression of our corporate calling. Um, right now, specifically what we're working on, there's two kind of main things we're working on. I'll bring them up because, uh, I always want to be authentic that um, it looks really great on the outside. Uh, Sparrow does. It's, and it is doing well. <clears throat> but we are always learning and always growing. I mean, uh, so the store, for example, uh, it's a retail store. Uh, it's on site where our, our other entities are. And um, retail's hard, y'all. Like, you don't make money for three years. It's hard. It's a hard business. And so Jessica Purvis leads out in Sparrow and Co. And we have had to become flexible and innovative on how we um, work the process. For example, um, where we're located, it's about to boom, but it hasn't boomed yet. So we're in that in-between space where we may or may not get customers in one week. And so we'd started a design house. Um, and the reason why is because we wanted to put our products and keep in mind our products, 100% of the net proceeds go back into our programs for women. Our products also, we have 15 local local partners and 22 global partners. Um, and so when you purchase goods from us, they make an impact all the way Kenya to India. Um, we are affecting lives worldwide. And so we believe wholeheartedly on our mission. But that also means that our price point's higher because we are creating change in um, other countries. And so people walk in the door when we do get customers and they're like, man, that's kind of high. But, like, but it feeds a family for a week. It's like, this is, this is it. And so we want to help women not only understand their identity, gifting and purpose, but also make purchases that are intentional. So it's the, the idea of living intentionally. Um, 
But even in the store, like I said, we've had to create a design house that we can help homes tell a greater story, um, that it's not just a plant and a pot, but it's something that when you look at that, it tells a story. It was created by a maker in Kenya. And here's here's her story. So it's it's going past just these quick purchases and it's purchasing with purpose. Um, but we've had to get innovative around how we sell those products. Um, you know, another thing can, you know, you're a part of S coaching. Uh, we are noticing more and more that while we can catalyze groups of people into their um, callings, we also need to go back and do story work. Um, story work is a key component. Um, we go back so that we can move forward. We can't go around it. We have to work through it kind of thing. And so um, we noticed that we were doing these large gatherings with people doing identity gifting and purpose, um, but recognizing the need to go even a layer deeper and do story mapping. And so we do one-on-one story mapping with people, uh, one-on-six story mapping. We have some really cool partnerships with different organizations where they're sending their leaders to us so that they can heal and be restored so that they can be catalyzed um, into, you know, cultivating the kingdom through their different vocation. So that's just a tidbit of like, it's a small part of what we do, but we're working through building those things, um, building out Sparrow and Co and being innovative, building out coaching. Um, and it is a day in, day out uh, process. And I, I think I, for a long time, hated the process. Uh, oh, I want to just get there and I want to get there now. But um, I mean, you've seen this on coffee cups. It's about the journey, you know? And I'm like, and, and I, yeah, it's about, it's about the mistakes. It's about what you do with the mistakes. Um, it's about the failure, um, that God redeems all things. And that when he looks at us, he sees Jesus and I am not the sum total of my failures. But yeah. I get to work through those things. And um, that we serve a father, like I'm going to bring it back to the father. Um, it's me being a little vulnerable, but I didn't, I felt like I had a father that I couldn't mess up, like growing up, I couldn't mess up. I had to be perfect, um, whether he told me that or not. And I love it that as I'm creating at Sparrow, that I have this father in heaven that's like, go girl, you're going to make mistakes. Man, you're going to trip. You're not going to listen to me but I'm still here and I'm not leaving you. Um, and that it is about the process of me tuning my heart to his voice as opposed to all the other voices outside of me and, and internally when I wrestle, you know? Um, so it's just as much about what we're producing as the character God's creating in all of us as a team, you know? Yeah. I'm so inspired by you, Rachel, for different reasons, but you know, our tagline is creativity meet courage. And I think you've embodied that. And I think a lot of times when we think about creating something, it is very, um, uh, I, I can't think of the word, but we're like dreaming. It's going to be wonderful. It's going to be, you know, just um, wonderful idea after wonderful idea that just comes easily into fruition. Um, but it really is more like a labor and uh, hitting walls and coming to junctions or coming to a hurdle and having to figure out how to be creative in the creativity and how to keep going and not give up. And I think you have embodied that courage that when you've been met with a challenge to something God's put in your heart to create, uh, you, you've drawn on your relationship with him and you've drawn on the courage he's given you to keep going. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that does, it images our, our creator to, to just to not give up. <laughs> um, that mm -hmm. to see something all the way to the end. And then even to be flexible with how that turns out, you know. And I think right. uh, creativity takes courage and flexibility. That maybe it didn't, maybe it's not going to look like what you thought it was going to look like when you started out. Um, but right. having the courage to just stick with it and not give mm -hmm. up. And I think you've done that really well. Well, thank you. I think it has to do with community. So Lauren and I obviously are dear friends. 
Uh, and it's having those people alongside you that go, no, this isn't it. Keep going. This is no, you, you can, you know, almost like holding my arms up in a lot of ways. You've got to have those people around you that will speak truth and also encourage. Um, and I also, on that note, um, how it, how it comes to fruition, you know, you have this idea and in the process of how it comes to fruition, what I've learned is, um, that my, my way of doing it, um, is, is not always the best way to do it. Yeah. Um, that I've really had to learn, um, that other people have really great ideas too. I'm not the only one. And sometimes with visionaries, you know, you get this complex, like it's my way. I am the visionary, you know? And, uh, I think through, through trial and failure, I have learned, uh, to listen to the people around me who also have really great ideas. And it might not be exactly what I want or exactly what I think should happen, but I think positioning myself in such a way that I would listen, um, put it before the Lord, really pray on it, and then let them create too. Um, I think the mark of a creator, the mark of a leader is that they would create an environment for others to create and flourish. I cannot say that enough. Um, I think there are leaders of organizations that it's their way or the highway and they don't create environments for their people to flourish and to create. And I think about, I think about Kristen, um, who is our executive director of local initiatives. And she just created the most glorious job training manual you will ever see for our at-risk women. And she, I'm so proud I'm so proud of her and, and, and what she created because I know it's going to change lives. And so as a leader, I can either go, no, I want my hand and I want my signature on everything. And I want to write everything. Or I think the mark of a real leader is to go, I want you to do exactly what God created you to do. I think about all those years she spent writing curriculum at school and, uh, you know, doing speech therapy. And that was just that furnace environment where she learned to do what she's doing now she's flourishing I'm just really proud of her so all that to say is my way is not always the right way so it's really being willing to engage my heart and go you know I want to create an environment for all these people to flourish so yeah there's something for me that's very romantic and nostalgic probably for my generation of retail and when it comes to, I mean, every dream period of my life, I think about owning a record store or a coffee <laughs> shop yeah. or a bar. Yeah. And I don't know why. And it's good to hear someone who's like, you don't make money for three years. You better love it. This better be your calling. You better be. <laughs> you better. This is yeah. not there's That's where the romance and nostalgia, you got to fight through that and go, is this my calling? And if it is, then I'm in and it's going to be failures and it's going to be working. But I can rubber stamp the Sparrow store because I got caught up in that darn thing when I went. <laughs> Kent's laughing because he know I texted him after I left. I felt like such a moron. Okay, so I went to the opening event. One, I was blown away by the, the, the whole facility. I didn't know what I was expecting, how big this building was. It was brand new and beautiful. So I'm in the store looking around and I'm shopping for the home. We had just bought a new house the way most husbands shop. And that's taking photos of things and texting your wife. <laughs> because I've been married 21 years, I'm not coming home with something that's not had some pre-approval. You yeah. know? So I'm texting all these different things from bags to a giant pot, giant pot. Um, and this little tin thing. I just knew some things that my wife would like. And I was sending her pictures. She was back like, all of it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah. I had to take two trips to my car walking down the street where I parked and it was crowded because you guys had a full house and I felt I'm just walking down the street with this giant pot, putting it in my car, going back for more. And I was like, Kent, they just took me for everything I'm worth. I, I'm going to have to take out a loan because I just bought one of everything at the Sparrow store. So it's good quality stuff too, where I think sometimes it's like stuff with a mission, but it's also fantastic. And so it's been Thank curated you. well, and it's, I don't know. I think that's the double whammy that, yeah. yes, it'll take a little time to catch on and the neighborhood's going to eventually boom. But when it does, I think you're going to be 
Yeah. You're doing it the right way. And I think it's going to be, it's going to pay off very well. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. That means a lot. I, yeah, we're really pumped about the store and how it, how it's come together, you know? So well, you'll have to come back soon because we have a whole new fall line. So no, I don't. To see uh, need, I'd love to no, see you in the store, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> and bring Tawny. Good grief. Please bring Tawny. My That's why I don't come up to the store very often because I know, I know what's going to happen. <clears throat> it's dangerous. I did, did want to say one more thing, Rachel, that you brought up um, as far as like, uh, leading well as a creative and allowing others to be creative around you. And I think, Stephen, you can probably speak to this too. That that goes even like, I think musically, like when um, I'm in a band or like leading worship with a team that I've found that the more that the leader is just kind of holding on to his or her vision, mm-hmm. it just lacks, uh, it, it just, it lacks something. It lacks beauty a lot of times because yeah. um, usually they're very, you know, capable players playing. And um, and then I can be with maybe a leader who expands it a little bit more, who's willing to hear, hey, what part do you hear there? Or, hey, feel the freedom to kind of do this here. And it it, it really changes the experience for everyone. And it, it builds trust too. And when you hear a band that trusts one another, there are a few things that sound that good. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that that goes across um, uh, just not genres. Like my words, you'll ever have days that you just like the words. You're like, I know the word that I'm looking for. I can't grab it anyway. But that goes across all kinds of crafts or uh, areas. Yeah. Of That's so I true. tell people I played with a with a leader, a song leader that. I knew my role as a bass player, both within the band and in his band. And I was fine with it because the bass player is an important role, but a very unseen and very sometimes unheard role based on the room you're in. And so (laughs) I would just do my thing. And then I switched to a whole new leader, which I was nervous about in a new environment, a new band. And he was like, man, you have all this weird stuff in your room, in your office, like instruments, guitars. He's like, you just need to be that guy. Be as weird as you want to be. And I will tell you if it's ever distracting. Because I used to sometimes show up and go, hey, I kind of want to play this synth, but I want to play the part for you first so that you don't have to make it awkward in rehearsal and tell me not to play it. Like, I want to save you from that awkwardness. Why don't I record it and I'll send it to you? And his response was like, no, no, no. Play whatever you want. Be as weird as you want to be, and I will tell you if it's yeah. too weird. And that, that blew me up. And I I played a different instrument every week for a year at church okay. to see if I could do it. Yeah. Um, but knowing knowing I had to play bass. So it was bass, low end related different instruments. And he never told me to reel it in. And that yeah. It 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 really was like gasoline on a fire for me that I didn't even know was there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's a lot on film sets. It's the first time I remember hearing this is a good director has the trust of his actors <clears throat> and actresses. Yeah. And so they can go take risk with their performance where they might mm-hmm. feel like, is this too much? Like, am I too sad in this scene? Am I mm-hmm. too happy? Am I whatever it mm-hmm. is? If they have a great director, you'll hear them, hear them say, oh, man, I trust that director to to get the right take and to not make me look crazy uh but that's yeah. a fine line right because if you're going for it in a scene yeah. i mean it's like you need somebody who you can trust as a safety net so you can mm-hmm. go for it as an actor and actress and that's the first time i remember really hearing that um you know a few different actors talk about that and go oh, okay that's what a great director does or part of what a great director does and I hear the same thing, you know, we're just saying that's true in leadership and creativity is that you need someone you can trust to create a safe place for you to create and, yeah. mm-hmm. and to mess up and fail and coach you, but also let you be who God made you to be uniquely. So I love okay. that. Um, mm-hmm. One of the things I wanted to hit, Rachel, is that you, someone could be listening to this and think like, Coop's like, oh my gosh, the building was bigger than I even thought. Uh, there's a retail store, there's coaching, there's an mm-hmm. event space, like, um, you know, like 
it sounds like, you know, this is a place that doesn't need any kind of funds. Uh, it's blowing and going. And here's the thing about the building is that I know is that that's, that's, you know, a very, 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 very generous gift, right? That, is. that, mm -hmm. that, that covered the building, but doesn't cover everything else. And so I guess mm -hmm. I'd love to hear you talk about the resistance you face. It's a weird thing to have that kind of, you know, almost like a generational gift, but it was a gift and it even surprised you, you know, when, when mm -hmm. that family approached you about that, cause they love the work that you were up to, but you were doing that work out of your home. Mm -hmm. You're doing that That's work, right. like just wherever you could find some space. And so I guess I just don't want to romanticize mm -hmm. things for people that are like, well, what I'm like in my office struggling by myself yeah. with a vision. So mm -hmm. I'd love to hear you just speak a little bit about that, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's good. So Sparrow started in 2011, uh, and we did not even get into the building until 2022. It's a long time. Um, it's a long time. Not that the building was time. in play all the way that whole time, but it wasn't in play point. to prove the point that um, there were days in my kitchen that I thought, this is a joke. I'm tired of this. I want to give up. Um, mostly because we are a nonprofit. So raising funding is hard. It's hard at every turn. Um, and so anyway, I had to be faithful with the small, my sweet husband, Trevor, y'all all know him. He just reminded me, first off, he, he kept saying, keep going, keep going. It's okay. Keep going. You're made for this. Go, you know, which you have to have that partner. That's like, you've got this, you've got this. Um, and you know, um, I'm trying to think here, like my mind's going in several different places. Um, it was, it was in the coffee shop. Like sometimes I look back and I, I want to be there again. And the reason why that sounds really odd me saying that, I know that because you see the struggle and you're like, what, you know, um, there is that it's like the fiery furnace of that hunger and that thirst for God to move and to do something that you can't do. Mm. Like us sitting in that building is a miracle. If I told you, well, I will tell you this. I was prayer walking, saw the building. God highlighted it to me. It looked like a dump. I mean, like a total dump, even though it was just a historical landmark, nobody had taken care of it. And God highlighted it to me. It was not for sale. I sounded like a crazy person. I think sometimes creatives, you just sound like crazy people. Um, but then you ask God to move and he does. It's a miracle. Um, but anyway, we ended up um, getting getting the building, but we had no money for the building. So then that's where a donor came in and said, you know what? We'll buy the building. We'll renovate the building to your liking. And then we just want to bless the community through this, um, which I, I think we could have a whole podcast on those people um, and, and their generous. It's like radical generosity. Um, I wish the Lord, I mean, I'm like, teach me to be like that, Lord, my goodness. Um, but I look back on the coffee shop moments and the struggle there going, God, will you, will you move? Um, because there was a nearness to him that I, that I had, I have it now, but now we're in the grind of things. So I'm going into the office every day. And, um, in order to be creative, I have to kind of separate myself from everybody. That's hard for me. I want to be in it with everybody, but I have to separate myself from everybody. So like this morning I'm working from home because I knew we were doing this podcast and it's my writing day. Um, so I'm, um, when I was in the coffee shop by myself. It was me and the Lord working some things out. They were formative years. Um, so I look back on that with fondness. I no longer look back on that and like, you know, I don't have that feeling that I used to have of God. Are you going to, are you actually going to do this? Um, I'm, I'm seeing that he did do this and now I'm wanting to go back and have that nearness to him and ask him to move again. Because the fact of the matter is, is now we have this beautiful building that's been donated to us. But I need him to move again because where we're heading is we want to provide jobs for women through sparrow production, which means we have to have funding. So we're in that space once again, where it's like, you're going to have to do this. Like in everything in me, I'm not capable. 
but you, God, you are. And so I need you to move. If you want these women to have jobs, if you want production to take off, okay, you're going to have to do it. And I think to the person that is alone in their office or alone at the coffee shop, man, I can relate to that in in sense that it is a season of time and allow the Lord to form and shape you into what he's moving you into next. And you don't know, I think it's remaining open-handed. I don't know what's next. It might not be a building. It might be something completely different. Um, is that what you were referring to, mm-hmm. Kent? Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, thanks for Just, sharing that. Yeah. Um, and then really what just the end part would love to hear about the sharing piece. We've talked about it some, you know, just as you've gone about, you know, the, creating this and then get into the world. Sometimes that's look like uh, conferences. Sometimes that's look like just being in living rooms uh, with small mm-hmm. groups of women. Sometimes yeah. that uh, now obviously looks like uh, events up at the building and um, different uh, restorative programs and and all those things. So. Again, I feel like with what the Lord has done through Sparrow, there's so much you could talk about, but maybe if you want to pick, uh, you've talked about retail already, so maybe picking S coaching events or something mm-hmm. of just like sharing that, what's mm-hmm. that process like uh, of trying to get the word out about this creation? Yeah. Um, so like I mentioned before, S coaching is, we're launching it in January. It's something that I've been doing for the last um really before COVID and sitting down with people and working through their stories, helping them understand their unique wirings and giftings, and then catalyzing them uh, into their purpose, into their mission. Um, I think it's really taking the blinders of uh, shame, comparison, competition off and going, nope, um, this is who God created me to be. And this is what he's created me to do and, and moving forward, taking one faithful step. And so I'm excited to share it because I think it's going to set people free. I think it's going to set people free on mission together to cultivate the kingdom of God um, in their workplaces, in their communities. Um, I, I think my prayer through Sparrow Coaching or S Coaching is that we would see uh, revival, the revival of creativity, uh, the revival of of doing the thing that God has asked you to do um, so that we can make much of him. Um, I'm excited to see people unleashed. Uh, I That is a prayer of mine constantly is that um, that we would see people unleashed and uh, running in their lanes with all that they can. Um, yeah, and that they would be clear and confident about it. So we're going to be sharing... Um, Gosh, we're releasing it in January. We've got our coaches trained up. Ken's actually one of our coaches. Um, we have several women's coaches. We do um, men's coaching, women's coaching, and then marriage coaching. Uh, marriage is really cool because we end up doing family mission statements. Um, we end with that super passion about that because um, I think you're given 18 years. Um, we're given 18 years with these kids. And I'm like, if we can be on mission, if we can teach them the art intentionality and mission early on um, and that they have giftings and wirings that we need to link arms with so that we can complete the mission. It's not like, hey, mom and dad are called to this. It's like, no, no, we're all called to this. And that Addie, that's my oldest. I'm like, you you bring um, order to chaos. You love organization. God's going to use that for his glory in this family and outside this family. And so it's it's making much of how they're wired and gifted and talented uh, and their talents um, so that that we can create a safe environment for them to use their gifts here so that when they go out in the world, they understand how to use them. That was never talked about growing up for me. It was like, you make good grades and that's about it, you know? Um, and so we can cultivate like <laughs> these babies' giftings. And their talents and, and those types of things and help them understand what they're going to offer to the world. Like, I'm in on that. We're going to see the next generation, you know, rise up with uh, more clarity and confidence, you know. So anyway, coaching, super excited about that as coaching um, and cannot wait to see other people get free and do what they were created to do. Yeah. Um, is it 
hard for you to sh- the sharing part? Is that hard for you? Or is the making part harder? Like when you think about creating and then you're like, all right, now I've got to get this out. I got to, you know, I want people to know we have this incredible program. Like, or do you love both? I think you know what I'm going to say. Um, I enjoy the creation part. Uh, the sharing part is harder for me. Um, it feels vulnerable and it feels, um, so just a part of my story, uh, there, there were some significant people in my life that were salespeople. And so because of that, I don't ever want people to feel like I'm selling them something. I want them to feel like this will authentically change your life. Why? Because it's changed mine, you know? Um, and so it's hard for me to uh, put into word what God's done in my heart so that other people will grab hold of it. Um, and I just, I'm, it's a work in progress. I'm working on sharing. Uh, I also think we live in a day and age where there's this like self-promotion. Um, I really don't love that. Um, and so it grinds against my heart a little bit. And so I struggle to share things because I don't, I don't want it to be about me or the brand or whatever. I want it to be about them, that it's going to change their lives, that they are going to like generationally, if they catch hold of this, that it will change their family's lives. Um, and so I think it's the way that I share it. That's probably going to uh, be necessary for me. Just, I want to be authentic and genuine. Um, I never want to package something just to package it, but to know that it's, it's bigger, it's bigger than a, yeah, it's bigger than a sales tactic. It's, it's bigger than one, two, three steps to whatever, you know, mm. that this is um, transformational. You know, it's not transactional. That's the thing. Mm-hmm. I don't want it to be transactional. I want them to understand, uh, other people to understand it's transformational. So, yeah. Yeah. Thanks for asking that. You, mm-hmm. you probably knew what I was going to say, but yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, it's a common thing uh, so far anyway on our shows. It seems like uh, overall it's the creating part that our guests have enjoyed and the sharing part that's more challenging. Um, mm-hmm. And I think it, for all the reasons you just said, right, um, mm-hmm. it, it, it makes total sense. But there is something about if if you really think this is a great song, a great book, a great uh, business, uh, a great coaching art, like if people don't know about it, then uh, that's not very helpful. You know, it really is like, so true. it's just like the light, you know, the the little metaphor of the light hidden under the basket, you know? Uh, yeah. So there is a great story that we're called to share as Christians about the hope mm-hmm. of Jesus um, mm-hmm. and the way of life and truth and beauty. Then there's these smaller stories that matter that we've been given, you know, a mm-hmm. calling to do. And, and so it's like, how do we do that authentically? You know, how do we share those smaller stories within context of the larger, greater story, uh, but mm-hmm. still do it and not neglect it? And I love that's. I think, again, it's a heart of Sparrow is that this isn't self-actualization. This isn't just yeah. do whatever in the world that you want to do in the moment, wherever your heart mm-hmm. takes you. It is, you no, know, God's given you your heart, a, a good redeemed heart for those who are in Christ. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, go follow that within what parameters the Bible gives, you know? Mm-hmm. And though, so um, I love that that's what you guys are doing. And so it's fun yeah. even to have you on to give you a chance to share about that, you know, with, with others. You. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you. I think sharing it now is the great, the reason it's hard for people is because of the great trade-off. So I tell people, like, especially teaching these young junior high kids songwriting, they don't know what, the music industry looked like in the nineties and or writing a book and you had to go to a publisher. And the only way it was going to get out there is if a publisher got a hold of it and put it out there or a record label got your album and distributed it to all the re- music stores. But your face wasn't there telling people about your music. So the great trade off is that nowadays anyone can write and make anything they want That's and right. get it to an audience. Now the problem is it's the wild, wild west and everyone's mm-hmm. doing it. So weeding through all the content that's out there is hard, but social media is now the way you have to sell things and make people aware of the things that you're offering. 
And that requires a face and a voice. And all I do is run into artists over and over and over that, I mean, the social media part of me putting my face on there, hey, I got a new single coming out tomorrow. Hey, check out the new merch stuff is destroying them day by day by day. Yeah. And just sucking the life force out of them to where they just want anything else. Like, I mean, they're almost like, I'll just share it and whoever finds it, finds it. I'm done. I can't push it anymore and do my Mm -hmm. songs and dance and come up with the content. So I think that's a really interesting place that the next generation is growing up in. Anyone can write and record and put anything on Spotify. You can self-publish a book and have it on Amazon. No one will find it. So you have to get strategic about it. And then it's social media. Yeah. And as a yeah. mid forties guy, that it's my kryptonite. <laughs> it is really hard at, at social media. It, uh, I have probably worried about social media more often than not. And, um, it took team members of mine going, Hey, like you're representing our work, what we do. And when they said that, I was like, I can do it then. I'll get out there then because it's, it's not about me. It's about them. And so, man, I'm such a two on the Enneagram. It's not even funny, but I just feel like if it's about them and us and our mission together, I can get on board with that. I can, I can go talk. I mean, I feel ridiculous half the time because I am 40 years old and here I am like a, like a tween, you know, on Instagram talking to the screen, you know, like a get ready with me or whatever. Um, oh, but nice. also too, I just want to, it, it does create though, um, you know, an invitational, uh, an invitation to, to, um, more of life behind. Like, I think if you can be authentic, it's an invitation to engage and connect, um, with what we're doing, the people that are on board here. Um, so yeah, it, it's just funny. I'm glad you mentioned that because it is, I've gone all sorts of ways with social media. I'm like, I don't know. I'm off. I'm out, you know? And then, and then now I'm back on and, and, you know, trying to be as authentic as possible. So. Mm -hmm. Um, well, what is the best way for people to follow Sparrow? Speaking of that, I know there's the Mm -hmm. socials and website, but what would you, what would you say? Where would you point people to? Yeah, I would point people Um, to sparrowcollective.org. You can get to all of our other social enterprise entities through that. So Sparrow on Main, Sparrow uh, and Co. And then S Coaching. You can connect with all of those on Instagram. Just keep in mind it's at underscore Sparrow Collective at underscore S Coaching. Um, And so you can find us on Instagram and all the places. You can find me at at, um, rachel.r.joy. Awesome. Thanks for doing this, Rachel. Man, it's so fun. You guys are the best. I can yeah. see why you started this podcast. Y'all are just so fun to talk to. Uh, I I love hanging out with Coop and Lauren and talking creative. I bet. So yeah, I, it's, yeah, we, and we've had great guests like you to be able to chat it up with. So, um, and if you're liking the show, uh, go to Apple and rate and review. Um, I'll just be shrewd with you and give you behind the scenes. That's what matters the most is uh, a lot of stuff just falls from that. So if you're enjoying it, um, go rate and review it. And thank you for those that have done that already. So, um, yeah, well, thanks again for joining us for make it share it and we will see you next time. Think. What if I fall? Well, what if you don't?